Hello viewers, welcome to this episode of Beat Diabetes. Diabetes is commonplace in our country and as a result you are fed with a deluge of information. Much of it is unauthenticated or false. To give the correct answers to your queries, we have lined up a panel of experts for you today. To my left, Dr. Neeta Deshpande, diabetologist and obesity physician from Belgaon. Uh, Dr. Tarun Mishra, endocrinologist from Raipur, and Dr. Arundhati Das Gupta, endocrinologist from Siliguri. Let's start uh, with Dr. Deshpande first. One of the often discussed questions is about family history and diabetes. And many a time, patients come to us and say, and you would face the same thing, that, you know, I have a family history, so my getting diabetes is inevitable. So is that statement correct? Well, uh, the statement that if you have a family history, you can get diabetes is true. But it doesn't mean that you have to get it. And there is definitely something about it that you can do. And that is having a good lifestyle. If you are able to maintain a healthy lifestyle in terms of your eating habits, in terms of your activity, in terms of getting enough exercise, there is definite evidence in all research studies as well that you can at least postpone or delay the appearance of diabetes, if not prevent it altogether. It's good to prevent it altogether, and if possible, one should try that. But even postponing the appearance of diabetes is good enough, because you are going to postpone the uh, appearance of the complications to that extent. So one can do that by having good exercise, cardio exercise, resistance exercise, different types, and basically eating right. Eating right, eating just enough, and avoiding a lot of junk foods <laughs> and uh, sugar-sweetened yes, beverages, yes, the kind yes. that you get nowadays. Yes. So if you are able to stay off all that and eat sensibly, I think you can definitely prevent, at least postpone diabetes. I think that's a very positive statement. And I, you know, we see people with bad lifestyle True. getting diabetes much earlier than their parents Absolutely. at a younger age. Yes. But as you very rightly pointed out, if you're careful, yeah. you can actually delay it sometimes even indefinitely. Okay. And that period that you get free of diabetes, that yes. added 10 years, 15 years, plays a huge role in your long-term complications. Yes. Thank you very much. So the next question is pertains to a big controversy these days. Should diabetes patients eat fruits? And what do you advise your patients? This is a question you're asked, all of us are asked every day. Can I have fruits, sir? What kind of fruits can I have? And I request Dr. Mishra to answer that. Actually, fruits are not banned, but uh, we have to not use the fruit juices. Because when we use, consume the fruit juices, we actually take more amount of carbohydrate and uh, fruits should be used uh, as a snacks. When we take uh, juices, it increases the glucose level very fast, very sharply, and fruit juices are not good. So we should take the whole fruit, and we can allow the patient 15 gram of the patient carbohydrate containing fruits, but we should know the different type of fruits, whether it has a more uh, tendency to raise the glucose. Fruits like apple and pear, blackberry, bear, they can be taken, but fruits which are more ripe, like mango, even lychee, angoor, can be taken if it contains 15 gram of carbohydrate. And another advantage of using fruits is it should be used as a snacks in between major meals, so it decreases the chances of blood sugar lo lowering. So the message from you is: a fruits can be consumed by diabetes patients. Fruits should be consumed whole and not as fruit juice. Different fruits have different compositions. We should use not more than 15 gram carbohydrate per serving of fruit. That should fit into the overall carbohydrate allowance of that patient. 
And the most important point you said, avoid using fruits as a dessert because you've already had carbohydrate with your meal and use it as a snack maybe between breakfast and lunch and between lunch and dinner. Uh, thank you for those very valuable points. Uh, we move to the third question today. And this one goes to Dr. Arundhati Das Gupta, really. Why do some people keep saying, my fasting sugars are high and my daytime sugars are not that bad, but my fasting sugars are high even though I have not eaten all night? What happens there? Uh, to understand that, I think we basically need to understand what happens to the glucose levels in a non-diabetic person. In a non-diabetic person, you know, when you consume carbohydrate, that is converted to glucose in the body. And we have an organ known as pancreas, which secretes a hormone known as insulin. So that insulin basically tells uh, the body how to take care of the glucose. So it tells the liver to kind of take up that glucose and store it as glycogen for future use. So that's a kind of a story, it's not to be used right now. What happens in the fasting state, and that's what happens normally at night, is that the body does not have a lot of sugar, the sugar levels are low. So now what the insulin is telling the liver is now you can liberate a little amount of glucose so that glycogen is broken down and liberated as glucose. This is what happens in a normal person. So in a fed state, glucose is taken up, stored in the hungry state, kind of it is released. But in a diabetic person, what happens is because the body is not listening to the insulin any longer, there's insulin resistance. So then even though the blood sugar levels are high and the liver is actually not supposed to release the glucose, it is still releasing the glucose overnight. So even though you're in a fasting state and you're assuming that your sugar levels are going to be low, your sugar levels go up in the morning. So that's what happens. So basically, liver protects us against low blood sugar. Right, so in normal situations, we don't die of low blood sugar even when we go on prolonged fasts. Why is that? Because the liver is a, is a storehouse for glucose and releases glucose at the right point. This becomes an abnormality in diabetes because it doesn't know when to shut off and it produces more glucose. So really it's not unusual at all for pe people to have higher fasting glucose, uh, especially if they have diabetes and often this is a sign of pre-diabetes also. We will now take a short break and we promise to come back with something exciting after the break. The homes that you bring, the dreams that you share, that you share. Healthcare partner. Welcome back after the break. Before the break, we had promised you a surprise. And the surprise is in the form of a quiz, a quiz on diabetes. At the start of the show, we had conducted a lucky draw from the audience members and selected four of them for this contest. The idea is really to have as many winners as possible because we want to spread knowledge and awareness about diabetes. Let us get to know our contestants better. I'm Amita Sharma. My age is 44. Uh, my diabetes was diagnosed around two years back. At that point of time, my weight was 106 kgs. So overall, by changing my diet and my fitness, I was able to lose 20, 25 kgs in the past one and a half years. And my diabetes is controlled. My name is Ajit Khanna. My age is 60 years. 2011, uh, after the random blood test, I have been uh, declared as a diabetic. I followed Mediterranean food and I would have salads and soups and no milk, no wheat, no, nothing. My name is KB Dubey, age 69 years. It was diagnosed in 1993 and right from 1993 till date I am suffering from diabetes. My diabetes is moderately controlled. I am your best safety and my age is 72 years. I'm a patient of type 2 diabetes since the last 35 years or so. Well, right now, with a lot of effort, I'm able to control it with manageable levels and I can rate it as fairly good. One has to walk in the morning, do exercises for at least half an hour a day, take control of food, and also the most important thing which I feel is be happy always and avoid of stress whatever comes to your life. 
now that we know our contestants, let us learn the rules of the game. There will be five questions. Each question will have four answer options. The contestants will be given voting pads having options A, B, C and D. And the contestants will select one right option, either A or B or C or D. Every right answer will get 10 points. The wrong answer will get no points, but there's no negative marking. The total score for all contestants will be displayed at the end of the contest. The one who gets the highest score will be declared the winner, who will be given a prize. But we really want all of you to be winners. We really want everyone should score the maximum. That's the idea of this quiz. So let's start with the quiz. You can see the question on the screen in front of you. The first question is, your mother has diabetes. You can prevent or delay onset of diabetes by A, not attending parties, B, maintaining ideal body weight, C, visiting the doctor regularly, or skipping one meal daily. Which of these is the correct answer? Punch your answer now. And we have an interesting mix of answers. The correct answer here is by maintaining ideal body weight. Two of our contestants seem to have gotten the correct answer, but the other two have not. Dr. Deshpande, you'd like to explain what we mean by this? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, even if you have a family history, with the correct lifestyle, you can prevent diabetes. The aim of having this correct lifestyle is basically to maintain an ideal body weight. And that is why that is the correct answer. Attending parties, well, <laughs> that's part of lifestyle. But if you are aware and if you know what you're doing, that's fine. Visiting the doctor regularly is also very important. But what's most important is keeping an ideal body weight. We are all the time sitting nowadays because everything is mechanized. And sitting is the new smoking, as they yes, say. Absolutely. And that is why maintaining an ideal body weight means that you need to eat sensibly, eat properly, have the proper kind of exercise, and make sure you're at the ideal body weight. Because at the ideal body weight, your insulin action is the best. And that's what will prevent diabetes in the future. So that's uh, wonderful advice, actually. Maintaining an ideal body weight is the culmination of your lifestyle efforts. And if you can do that, you will not just prevent diabetes, but a lot of other conditions that go with it. And here is the second question for you. HPA1C gives you an average blood sugar control of the preceding 15 days, one month, three months, or six months. You can punch in your answer now. Whoa, this is a very informed audience. Amazing. The correct answer is three months. HPA1C reflects the preceding diabetes control over the last three months, and everyone seems to be aware of that. Uh, Dr. Mishra, can you explain a little bit about HPA1C? How frequently should it be tested? Why is it important? Glycosylated hemoglobin is a measure of glycemia over previous three months. And when sugars are high, it combines with RBC and forms the glycosylated hemoglobin. In patients who are controlled, uh, it should be done every six months. And those who are uncontrolled, it should be monitored every three months. It gives an idea regarding the complications of diabetes. And it should be monitored and mentioned during every uh, visit to prevent the acute and chronic complication and di of diabetes. Various trials have shown the importance of uh, glycosylated hemoglobin in postponing uh, the complication of diabetes and it has diagnostic value also. We can uh, diagnose uh, diabetes with the help of glycosylated hemoglobin. So it's a very valuable test. It's a test that reflects last three months of blood sugar, mean blood sugar. Uh, in general, a target that we advise our patients is seven, but there are others who may be requiring even tighter control where you may say 6.5 or even six sometimes. But there are others who will require less tight control, which may be 7.5 or 8. So it's very, very important to ask your doctor at your first meeting, what is my HbA1c target? Here is the third question. Which organ in your body produces sugar naturally at night and in the early hours of the morning? And the options are 
pancreas, gallbladder, liver, and heart. Punch in your answer now. Very interesting. Uh, as usual, we associate pancreas with diabetes, but the correct answer is liver. And we'll have Dr. Das Gupta again explain to us why liver is the correct answer and why two out of the four contestants still thought it is pancreas. Yeah, generally because we tend to associate pancreas with the diabetes is perhaps why you thought pancreas is the answer. But pancreas does not secrete sugar, it does not liberate sugar. What it does it is it releases an, a hormone known as insulin which is responsible for the glucose uh, levels, for keeping the glucose levels under control in the body. So it just does the opposite, it does not increase the sugar levels, right? Heart, again, not directly related to the glucose metabolism of the body, but then again, high sugar levels having a very strong effect on the heart. The two contestants who got it correct, and, uh, you know, very correctly is like the liver. Why? Because as we just discussed, uh, liver is the storehouse for glucose. So. When you need it, the body is supposed to secrete a glucose. So that is why overnight when you're not eating and the, the sugar level is going down, then the body needs that sugar from the liver. And then the, the body asks the liver to you know, release that sugar, which is why uh, the liver is responsible for that rise in blood sugar levels in the morning. So the distinction is clear. Pancreas makes insulin. Liver re stores and releases glucose. So both have an important role to play. And here comes the next question. If you are overweight, losing weight through lifestyle modification will improve insulin action. B, decrease insulin action. C, increase insulin level. D, increase blood sugar level. This could be a tough one for doctors to punch in your answer now. This is absolutely amazing that all four of our contestants realize that improving lifestyle and therefore maybe losing weight, but exercise actually improves insulin action. It's great that everyone understands that. The key point here is that ultimately you may also improve insulin secretion, but the fundamental thing that happens when you start exercising or when you lose weight you actually improve the action of insulin. So the doors for insulin, they open up. And therefore, you know, you, the same insulin that is present in your body starts to act better. So before we move to the next question, uh, Dr. Deshpande, you want to add something there about insulin action? Yes. Uh, being overweight has everything to do with insulin action. What's important to understand is that when you are overweight, the insulin action is not proper and hence you require more insulin to do the same work, which means to say that if you lose weight, then less amount of insulin can do the same amount of work and bring down the glucose, which is what we want. And hence, weight has a direct relation to the action of insulin, which means to say that it brings down insulin resistance, makes your insulin more sensitive. What it means is that as you lose weight, you require less amount of insulin, which then your pancreas can possibly handle, and that is how you make do with less insulin. So losing weight is a very good idea. So I'll ask Dr. Das Gupta a line. I mean, when you talk of weight loss, how would you weigh diet and exercise, the relative contribution of these in trying to lose weight? Some people, uh, you know, you see people who are not able to keep up with the exercise regimen, you know, not able to count. So I would say probably then the uh, the role of diet comes in more strongly. Sometimes you're out, you're not able to exercise, you control your diet better. But ideally both should go hand in hand. I mean, one cannot do the other's job. So diet is about restricting the calories, exercise is about making your body, uh, t t you know, the, the action of insulin is better. So you're just what, the, what, you're, what you said in your answer. So you, you cannot take one without the other. If you want to maintain an ideal body weight, both have to go hand in hand. Diet is extremely important in weight loss and where exercise comes in is in the maintenance part. Absolutely. When you want to maintain a good body weight which you've lost, that's when exercise comes in because it helps to maintain your metabolic rate which slows down once you've lost weight. So ideally, they are complementary to each other, one coming after the other, perhaps. 
very true, uh, both play an important role, both diet and exercise, especially when, it, when you're overweight and trying to lose weight, it is very hard to lose it unless you're on a low calorie diet or reducing your calories. And if you want to remain fit while you lose weight, at the same time also maintain that body weight that you achieve, exercise plays a key role. So both are very, very important in our lifestyle measures. And here comes the last question. Type 2 diabetes is the common variety of diabetes that we see and it can be caused by insulin deficiency alone, insulin resistance alone, insulin resistance and relative insulin deficiency or an abnormal type of insulin secretion. Punch in your answer now. So three of our contestants have got the right answer, which is insulin resistance and relative insulin deficiency. And uh, it is nice that people have begun to understand these concepts. I would like Dr. Mishra to explain this a little bit more. Type 2 diabetes uh, is characterized by more insulin production, means we call it hyperinsulinemia and related insulin deficiency. That is the correct answer because body produces more in insulin and body is not able to utilize the insulin which is produced. But since diabetes is a progressive disease with due course of time, there is a progressive beta cell failure. And uh, later on, there is a development of uh, insulin deficiency also. So both are important and central to the development of type 2 diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, as well as uh, insulin deficiency. So what Dr. Mishra is telling us that type 2 diabetes is a mix of both these. Typically, insulin resistance starts first which leads to more insulin secretion by the pancreas as it tries to overcome because insulin is not able to act properly. You need more insulin for the same action. So pancreas makes more insulin. At some point, the beta cells of the pancreas, as you pointed out, start failing. And therefore, there is relative insulin deficiency. A combination of these two leads to what is typical type 2 diabetes as contrasted with diabetes in children, which is classically type 1 diabetes, where it is just deficiency of insulin and resistance does not play a big role. Thank you for participating in this quiz and the winner for today's show is Mrs. Amita Sharma. <laughs> Wonderful. Congratulations. I will now request the winner and the other contestants to come on stage to collect their prizes. Dear audience who are watching and supporting this program from your home are also an integral part of the show. You can test your awareness level of diabetes by answering this simple question. Can people with diabetes eat fruits? A. No, fruits are not allowed at all. B. Yes, if they stay within the carbohydrate allowance. C. They can eat plenty of fruits as fruits do not raise blood sugar. D. They can only eat citrus fruits. Out of the four options shown to you, please SMS the choice of right answer to the phone number displayed on the screen. Polling lines will be open till Monday, 12 p.m. The winner will be declared in the next episode by a lucky draw from the right answer. So I'd like to thank the panelists for their time, the absolutely wonderful contestants, and the audience who've sat through this and enjoyed, I hope, this session of quiz and beat diabetes. <laughs>